I've never actually said this before. If I'm being completely honest, I'm able to do a little bit of healing and a little bit of growing in every single place. And when I leave from every country, there's a part of me that's been reborn again. And there's a part of me that has also died. It's a lot when you're traveling to different countries, you are able to slow down time a lot. So you're able to think about some of the things that you did or some of the things that you didn't do, missed opportunities. And whenever I'm solo traveling, it's really a moment of clarity and reflection for me. And I'm able to make peace with a lot of things and also make new personal agreements with myself, create personal expectations with myself, be a lot more confident and then move on to the next country. And whatever I didn't like about myself, I left it. I left it in that country. And whatever I liked about myself, I took it with me to the next country now. This is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers. And learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody. It's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. My guest today is Shakima Smith. She is a location-independent entrepreneur, travel influencer, and founder of Travel Like a Boss, an online training program that teaches women how to solo travel the world safely, confidently, and without draining their bank account. Shakima has solo traveled to more than 55 countries, many of them for under 100 US dollars, and she has coached over 1,500 women on how to start their world travel journeys. Originally from East Orange, New Jersey, she is now based primarily on the Caribbean island of Antigua, where she's in the process of getting her second passport. Shakima has over 40,000 followers on Instagram and has been featured in Travel Noir, Essence, Forbes, USA Today, Business Insider, The Washington Post, and the list goes on. Keem, welcome to the show. What up, everybody? Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you here. This is going to be an awesome conversation. But first, let's just start off by setting the scene and letting folks know where we are doing this interview from tonight and the fact that we have agreed to make this a wine night. So let's also talk about what we are drinking. I am actually based in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina this evening, and I have just opened a bottle of South African Pinotage, Ooh. which is tasting very nice. But uh, where are you tonight, Keem, and what are you drinking? So tonight I'm in East Orange, New Jersey. I'm from Ill Town, and I'm just having some peach Moscato tonight. I'm keeping it cute. You know what I mean? I love that. And we have to start off with Ill Town because we got a lot of hip hop fans, first of all, that listen to the podcast, but also we have people from 140 different countries that listen to the podcast that are not going to know and be familiar with a lot of the nuances of some of the real origins of the greatest hip hop of all time, which definitely includes East Orange, New Jersey. And you grew up there in the 90s, which was during the golden era of hip hop. So can you just sort of take us back there and talk about what that was like growing up in East Orange in the 90s at that time? Man, let me tell you all something. It was a time like like you were lucky to be alive. Like Drake said, what a time to be alive. That was a time to be alive. Like growing up in the 90s, we would see Queen Latifah, Naughty by Nature on Tremont Avenue. Like you would see Lauren Hill walking down South Orange Avenue, like Wyclef Jean, Method Man standing on a corner, Red Man. It was it was real. That was when, you know, you actually had to have talent, you know, to be a rapper. But it was absolutely amazing. 
and you had some of the greatest rappers of all time that were from your neighborhood, literally. I mean, like, how was that as a kid just to be there in that environment and to know you're hearing all these folks on the radio and some of the greatest MCs that ever did it and they're from your neighborhood? It was just different. It was like everything was so much more authentic. Everything was more real, you know? Growing up in East Orange and you actually could see Method Man walking down the street and Queen Latifah is doing events in your neighborhood, on your block, having a block party, giving out coats. Wyclef Jean, Tretch is literally outside with Peppa. That was real on Ninth Avenue. Like, that was real to us. That's so amazing. That's so amazing because I was a hip hop DJ during the 90s. And when a lot of those artists dropped their first albums, I mean, that's how literally I came to know about East Orange, New Jersey from Naughty by Nature's first album that they dropped in 1991 because they repped East Orange in every single song. You could not listen to a Naughty by Nature song, let alone an album, and not be extremely clear about exactly where they were from. And so these groups were putting it on the map, and these were some of the greatest artists and the greatest songs. And so I became incredibly well aware of East Orange and exactly what was going on there. But man, to grow up there in the midst of all that, I mean, what an amazing era. I mean, at you know, Whitney Houston is one of the biggest celebrities from my town, East Orange. And, you know, when we were growing up, we went to Cicely Tyson Elementary School. You know, Whitney Houston was literally from East Orange. Like we have so many talented people coming out of our city. That's amazing. So let me ask you this. As you were growing up, I'm really curious, how did your interest in travel develop and your sort of desire to travel the world? So it actually started with my mother. You know, I'm one of six kids. We from the hood. That's not a secret. I'm not ashamed of it because at the end of the day, that built a lot of character for me, you know, having to get very creative. And um, when I was a kid, you know, I'm the oldest of six kids. My parents, they're high school graduates and they're doing the best that they can. My mother couldn't afford, my mother and father could not afford to take us anywhere. But my mother bought me a globe and I would have to do a book report about different countries. And she would always tell me like, one day you could see the whole world. The life is bigger than East Orange. And I'm from Third Ward, East Orange. I'm from Carnegie and Shepherd, East Orange, you know? So um, I'm not even from, I'm from the South Ward. Like I'm not even from the nicer part of East Orange. But my mother always kind of reinforced that if I wanted to, I could actually see more. And that's pretty much how it got it started, just with that at-home education, even though we didn't have anything. She planted the idea that it was a possibility for me. And then what was the path from there to actually going on your first international trip? How did that actually happen? How did you make it a reality? It was actually quite organic. It was a complete accident. Um, I just started traveling with my friends and then um, I ended up getting left on vacation by two of my friends on my birthday weekend in Greece. And from there, I was like, yo, I'm never fucking traveling with nobody again. Nobody will ever have the one up on me to make me feel like they could just leave me if we disagree on something. I really didn't have a choice to, you know, to solo travel. I didn't really want to do it, but solo travel chose me. (laughs) And then you have been doing some serious solo travel ever since. You have now solo traveled to over 55 countries. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that, right? Like once you make that decision and you said, okay, I'm going to solo travel. What were your initial fears or concerns or trepidation? And like, how did you go about sort of figuring that out and structuring that solo travel lifestyle? Well, I think once I got over the money part, because, you know, me being black and from the hood, we think that like in order to travel, like that's a white people luxury. Like, oh, well, we can't afford to travel like only white people could do that. You know, that's a luxury. But once I changed my mindset and said, you know what, that is my birthright. Things kind of started to fall in place from there. The universe kind of the universe conspired for my highest good from there. So um Once I got over the money part, it was more so like, am I going to get snatched and sold into sex slave slavery? Because that's what people are telling me is going to happen. And um, I decided to do one trip. I said, you know what? I'm going to go to Paris and I'm only just going to do one trip. And, you know, as if I can make it back home, I may not like it. But if I can just complete the trip 
and prove to myself that I can do it, I'll never have to do it again. Let me just do it one time. And from there, Paris, country number one, uh, you know, France, you know, um, I felt liberated and I was like, yo, it's over from here. I got it. I could do it. I love that. Well, I want to ask you to break down some of the misnomers that people have about how expensive travel is and how you have been able to travel to a number of foreign countries literally for under $100. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I've been to 55 countries, as you said, but my first 20 countries, I I visited them for under $100. And like I said, you know, I'm from the ghetto, so I tend to get really creative about how I can do things with the least amount of financial resources. I'm one of six kids. My mom, we would go to get clothes and she would like point out missing buttons and stuff and they would give us money off and me and my five siblings would have clothes. So, <laughs> so I'm no stranger to being very creative to get what I need. And I, I went to my first uh, first 20 countries for under one hundred dollars. And I did that by putting flights on layaway um, through this black owned company called Air Affordable. And I also would actually go on Skyscanner and I would actually like optimize the search engine to make it tell me how, what countries I could visit for under $100 and what month the tickets were all under $100. So if I could find 12 different flights for under $100 and they were each in a different month, well, essentially I just went to 12 different countries for $1,200. So that's how I was able to do that. I went to Guatemala for $62. I went to Panama for $82. I went to Costa Rica for like $66. Like I posted all of these receipts on my Instagram, but that's how I was traveling. So I wasn't riding around and getting it, y'all. I was just trying to figure out how to optimize these search engines. So that way your girl was on a grand flexing, but not like exhausting my bank account to do it, you know? Yes. Amazing. And Skyscanner is a super important resource for folks that haven't used that. We will link that up in the show notes so you can go and check it out. But the technique, which is important, right, which I have used as well, is to you put in the airport that you're flying flying out from, okay? So if you live somewhere and you fly out of the same airport all the time, that's the airport you put in. Or if you're a nomad and you're traveling around, it's like whatever airport you happen to be near, whatever country you're in, just put that one in. And then you, for the destination, you put everywhere, right? And then that is going to show you the least expensive countries for you to fly to from the airport that you're in and for the timing, if you put any time, right, <laughs> like whenever, then it'll show you the cheapest month to do it. And that way you can find, you know, a dozen plus countries that are going to be under 100 bucks from wherever you are. Easy, simple. Now, I did not know, by the way, one of the things that you taught me, Kim, is that you could put flights on layaway. I literally had never even heard of that until I was watching your content. Can you talk about how that works? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, you know, like I said, grew up poor, you know, we, we got it out the mud, but my parents did the best that they could. And so layaway is this concept that, you know, you want to purchase something and you essentially ask the merchant to hold it for you at the price that, you know, you're purchasing for it and you just break down the payments until you're finished paying off the balance. So that's what layaway is for everybody who, you know, hasn't ever heard of that. So when I was growing up, my mother would put our clothes on layaway, you know, so that way we could have clothes for the next school year. And so most people don't know that you can actually put flights on layaway. Um, there's this black owned company called Air Affordable and you find a ticket that you like on Expedia or Google flights, you screenshot it. You send it to Air Affordable and you just make a small deposit. You make four installments and boom, you got your ticket. So if I wanted to go to South Africa and the ticket was eleven hundred dollars, but your girl had to pay her rent. Right. Um, I would put that flight on layaway. So that way rent was paid and I was still going to South Africa regardless. <laughs> Right. So you can lock in the best flight deals when they uh, come up. But if you have a travel budget that, let's say, is a monthly budget and you can only spend this much on travel uh, per month, and but you see like an amazing flight deal, you can lock it in and then you can just continue to pay for that ticket monthly, it, even though it may be like way in the future. You And that way you get the best deals and you don't have to break the bank doing it. That's amazing. 
So let me ask you this, Kim. When you started doing all of this traveling, you were working at a nine to five job. And I want to ask you about how you structured your travel because in the United States, most people get like two weeks of vacation a year, something like that. And here you are going to a different country like every month. So could you talk about how you structured your travel with a regular full-time office job? Yeah. So y'all, you know, I had to learn the art of finesse. All right. So let me put y'all up on game. This how I, this how I finesse that shit. So at my job, we had two weeks vacation time. We had sick time, but then we also had something called comp time. And basically your comp time is if you work overtime, you can elect instead of being paid time and a half in cash, you can elect for it to go to like a certain PTO bank and it's time and a half, but it's time and a half, not in the form of cash compensation, but in PTO time. So what I would do to work the shit out, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we got to, you know, so instead of ingenuity in the hood, we call it nigganuity. Like we had to get like real, uh, you know, um, creative. Right. So this is what I did. Um, the first two weeks of each month, I will work my OT, but I would do it in time and a half. So that way, if I worked four hours a day, that would technically be like six hours in overtime in the in the comp time. Right. So if I did six hours um, every day for two weeks, you know, I had more than enough time in comp time to take the vacation. And then the last two weeks of the pay period, your girl was out here asking for cash. So that way I could actually buy the ticket for the fucking flight that I was about to go on. And then when I would put in the overtime, I would always take it out of my comp time bank so they could never catch me for leave abuse because I was never using the vacation time they could never say well you don't have no more vacation time you motherfucking right I do I've been using comp time this whole fucking time what you think I'm here for so you know I had to finesse it so that way for the first two weeks I had the comp time for the second two weeks I had the cash to pay for the trip I was going on and then at the end of the year I would have all this vacation time because I never used it I would only use comp time so that was how I was finessing it another way that I worked it out Check this out. Every month has a holiday, right? So January, we got Martin Luther King. February, we got President's Day. March, we got Good Friday, right? So what I would do was I would take a long weekend and just use the holiday. So if Martin Luther King Day was on a Monday, I would take Friday off only. But then I would have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then I fly back home on Monday night. So basically I could hit up another country without even with only using one day a month. And of course that was coming out of comp time, but it was like a long weekend as well, because I always made sure that I traveled before or after a paid holiday. So that was how I was working it out between having time and not having, you know, issues with leave abuse and still, you know, trying to make the cash to be able to fund my dreams. I basically used my corporate job to float my dreams. That is amazing. And can you talk a little bit about how you did your research for your trips and designed your itineraries? Because you basically said the destination selection, at least initially, was based on where you could get cheap flights from where you are. And so you're like, okay, that's where I'm going. Once you decided that's where you're going and you grabbed that flight, what's your process for trip planning and itinerary creation? So first I look up, um, I download the smart traveler enrollment program. Um, most women who travel solo, one of our biggest concerns is safety, right? So what I did was I researched and I found out that the United States embassy has actually a safety program called the smart traveler enrollment program. So you can actually download it, let the U S embassy know where you're going. And then you can also complete an itinerary with all your information, which hotel you're going to be at, um, which excursions you're going to do, where you're going to eat, you know, just just anything, every single move that you're going to make. And you can actually send it to the U.S. Embassy in that country so they know that you're there. You can sign up for alerts with the U.S. Embassy so that way you know if something's going on in that country. So the first thing that I do when I book a trip, you know, like that Guatemala for $66, I'm like, great, let me let me reach out to the U.S. Embassy and let um, the U.S. Embassy know in Guatemala that I'm actually coming. Because remember, they're Americans, right? So they're going to let you know, like, hey, dog, after eight o'clock, don't go down this block. You need to know this. You need to understand that we have a lot of, you know, MC-13s in Guatemala City, 
and you need to keep it pushing when you get off that, when you leave the airport. Like, you know, so um, I would say definitely contacting the U.S. Embassy. And guys, this is a free service. The Smart Traveler Enrollment Program is actually a free service for all United States citizens traveling abroad. You can lo- you can register with the local U.S. Embassy in that country and just let them know, like, yo, dog, I'm here. I'm here in your, you know, I'm here in this country. And then when you are actually planning the stuff that you're going to do in these countries, what is your sort of process for saying, okay, I'm going to Guatemala. How do I want to plan my three days or my four days or my week or like however long you were going there for? What's your process for kind of designing a really epic itinerary? I think it depends on what kind of mood I'm in, because like sometimes you know, I'm ready to turn up all the way up and I'm on a hundred. And then other times I'm like, you know, it would be really nice to just get some sun and be on the beach. So I think, you know, it depends on what kind of mood I'm in. And then I kind of figure out like, what is it that I want to get out of this vacation? And then from there, you know, I start putting it together. I love that. Well, I want to talk to you about a couple of the places that you have gone. One of the places that you've been that I have not been is Zambia. I've been to probably about 11 countries in Africa by now, but Zambia I have not yet been to. It's super high on my list, so I'm definitely going to get specific tips from you when I go. But I want to just ask you about how was that experience for you in Zambia? Zambia was a whole vibe, but it was also a minute for me to kind of reflect on how fortunate I've been because travel makes you quite humble and it makes you a storyteller. When I went to Zambia, I realized not that I hadn't really realized before, but it just kind of hit different that your worst day is somebody's best day. You need to be great. You know, you need to just practice more gratitude. So I absolutely loved it. I actually sponsored four kids in Zambia. My mom and I decided to fund the school so that way they could feed the children. The children in Zambia only eat at school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And outside of that, they don't get much food. So sometimes they come to school just to eat. And when me and my mom found that out, we were like, no, we're going to feed every last child in the school for just 30 days. You know, that was what we could afford. And that's what we did. And a part of my ego died in Zambia. I'm going to keep it 100. And then you spent uh, a while in Zambia, though, right? And you checked out a whole bunch of different stuff, including the animals, yeah. right? So I want to hear about the safari experience that you had in Zambia. I absolutely loved it. Um, it was super authentic. I loved it. It was amazing. I actually walked with a cheetah and walked with some lion cubs and I'm not gonna lie I'm a thug but I was scared as fuck like (laughs) so (laughs) (laughs) wait then what happened with the elephant you told me there was a story with an elephant as well (laughs) (laughs) so guys um I went to Zambia And um, if you go to Livingstone, Zambia, you can actually drive right across the border or ride a bike right across the border into Zimbabwe. And I decided to rent a bike and, uh, you know, like a motorbike and just drive over the border from Zambia to Zimbabwe. I had did it, you know, the past three days that I was there. Everything was supposed to be Gucci, right? Y'all, why I'm in Zambia and I'm trying to get back into um, Zimbabwe. And all of a sudden I hear people going, no, no, throw the food down. Because, you know, I was I had food on me, you know, because I'm like, well, I don't want to pay for no restaurants or anything like that. I have food at the hotel. They made my plate. I just strapped it to the back of my motorbike. No harm, no foul. Right. Wrong, dog. Wrong. So this is when shit went left. So people are yelling behind me in English, like, put the food down. And I look and there is a wild elephant coming my way. And I'm like, man, fuck that nigga. He can't even run that fast. Like, it's whatever. Like, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it until he started being right under me. And I realized, yo, dog, I'm about to be elephant like soup. Like, this is what it's come down to. This is how it all ends. Like, and so... <laughs> So I just threw, I just tossed the food down and like the elephant moved to the side. He immediately went for the food. And when I pulled over, the locals were like running over to me, like, look at this dumb broad. Like, you know, and so the, ele- the you know, the, the locals are running over to me like, are you OK? Are you OK? And I'm like, 
uh, I'm fine, but what happened? And they were like, these are wild elephants. They need food. They're looking for food. They have no way to eat. So we never cross the border where they're waiting on the sides with food because they have trunk. Like, they're going to take your food. And I was like, bro, I was today fucking years old when I learned that you cannot have food around wild elephants. Like I just learned this. Like, and so I called my mom. And I'm like, eh, eh, eh. and she's like, oh my God, what's wrong? And I was like, oh, I got chased by a wild fucking elephant. It was lit. And she was like freaking out. <laughs> that is amazing. So, all right. I also have to ask you about your Australia experience because you have been skydiving, which is something that I have never gotten enough courage up to go and do. So I want you to tell me how your experience was in Australia in general and how was the skydive experience? It was absolutely amazing. The people in Australia were quite friendly. These Aussies, and let me tell you something about them Aussies. They could drink. They could drink. They were nothing but hospitable. I had a wonderful time. I felt welcomed. Um, Australia was also very clean. Wasn't a, you know, at at least Sydney, like Sydney was a beautiful, very clean city. The people were absolutely amazing. And yeah, I skydived uh, 13,000 feet in the air. Unbelievable. And how was that for you? What was the experience like? I've never done it. I was scared. I was so scared, but I just wanted to prove to myself that I can actually do it. Um, But I could have never imagined how good it would feel once I jumped out like there was this feeling that you were falling but it only lasted like a split second but time was different it seemed like everything went faster when I was skydiving but when I opened my eyes and they touched my hand and was like you know move your hands out like you know um it felt like I was flying and I always got so much liberation from being on an airplane and being up that high and knowing that I was about to change the scenery and see something different and, you know, experience so much euphoria, but there was nothing like actually flying and looking at it, you know, 360 degrees, not like not through a window seat window, but like actually flying in the air, letting the air touch you. You can feel the sun is hot on you. It was just, it was just a whole mood. That's so dope. Did you make it over to Melbourne in Australia when you were there? No, I only went to Sydney. So I have actually not been to Sydney, but I have been to Melbourne. And one of the things that I have been talking about Melbourne ever since I got back is how dope the graffiti art scene is in Melbourne. It is some of the most amazing street art I've seen anywhere in the world because I look for that wherever I go because I love to experience cities through the lens of the street artists for one thing, right? Because it's typically, you know, a very unfiltered, you know, anti-establishment expression uh, in communication, you know, from particularly from marginalized groups that live in that in that city. Right. So I love to kind of see an impression of the city from the people that live there that's not filtered by the government or corporations and things like that. So I love street art. And of course, I love the art form of graffiti. Right. I mean, just as part of hip hop culture. And I love to see how that's been taken and adapted around the world and things like that. And so, you know, so I've, I mean, I, I really, you know, I have gone on the street art tours and really studied this stuff in some of the some of the top cities in the world, Bogota and Colombia and Sao Paulo and Brazil and some of the places that have like legendary street art. And I will tell you that Melbourne, Australia, of all places, is like way up on my list because and you're going to appreciate this, too. The street art, the love for specifically East Coast 90s hip hop in Melbourne, Australia is ridiculous. Wow. The the graffiti art, right? They have all these like graffiti alleys, like whole giant sections that are just all of this graffiti art. It's not just the iconic you know, stuff that you would see all over the place on t-shirts, like the, like Biggie and Tupac, they have that, right? But it's not just that they have massive murals to, uh, Pete Rock and CL Smooth, uh, Tribe Called Quest. They have a mural of the Apollo Theater with Rakim's name in the limelight performing the Apollo. They had three boogie down production album covers as giant full length wall murals wow. right BDP like all of this in Melbourne right I walked into a random pizza shop 
in Melbourne, and there is a DJ who has, first of all, Technique 1200 turntables, okay, <laughs> and has 12-inch vinyl records that he is pulling out of milk crates, wow. okay, and putting on the table, and it's all 90s East Coast hip-hop that he's playing, song after song after song. I'm like, where am I? It was crazy. That was what's up. You know what? When you said the milk crates, a little voice went off in my head. You ever heard, you know, that voiceover on TikTok? It says, tell me you're ghetto without telling me you're ghetto. And you got the milk crates. <laughs> like, like. <laughs> you got the milk crates. Listen, I was a DJ in the 90s, right? So it was all 12 inch vinyl and we put them in milk crates and we carried the milk crates. I'd hire a buddy of mine to go do the DJ gigs to carry my <laughs> record crates and my equipment and take requests and stuff like this. But it was literally like, that's how it was back then, right? Like right. I would go to the record store every Tuesday <laughs> And because that's when the new records would come in and I would listen to all the new 12 inch singles that came out and I would buy the ones that I liked and I'd buy two copies of them so I could mess with them on the turntables, mm -hmm. right? And then you would literally go home and count the beats per minute to figure out how fast this song was. You would sit there with a timer and you would count the beats per minute and then you would, and then you would put a, a sticker and you would write with a Sharpie marker, 104 beats per minute. And then you would have your milk crates, your records organized by speed. Uh, so you would know which ones you could mix with the other ones with just slight no. variations on the speed. So you could beat mix. No. Them. This was literally the process right now. Of course, today people that are starting to DJ now, I mean, that's like some archaic, <laughs> you know, they're like, what are you talking about, dude? It just says it on my thing and I don't have records. I just have the, you know, I mean, you know, I just bring it off my lap top and it just appears right. there you know all this kind of stuff so like when this dude had like milk crates full of 12 inch vinyl and he's pulling them out and putting them on there i'm like man Respect. this is some throwback stuff yeah for real it was ridiculous so yes yeah, so i have a lot of love for melbourne, for melbourne but but um yeah so but i had not been to sydney though so so you you have to give me some some tips next time i go to sydney but i do want to ask you i want to ask if you can build a little bit on the safety for particularly for solo female travelers, right? But safety in general, right? Like a lot of folks, that's a barrier for them, right? To go world traveling, especially to go alone. What are the biggest misconceptions do you think about safety when traveling the world? I think the biggest um, misconceptions is that oh, don't go out there because it's unsafe. You will get snatched. You, you know, something will happen to you. I've been to fifty five countries you know, besides the U.S. and the United States is actually the most unsafe place that I have ever been in in my life. I lived in Paris. I'm currently getting my citizenship in Antigua and I'm actually making my exit out of the U.S. because it's so unsafe. So, you know, as a woman who has seen only 17 percent of the world, um, I can assure you that the United States is actually the most unsafe place there is. It's actually not you know, unless you're going to Afghanistan or, you know, just just something that's, you know, Syria, like somewhere that it's like bombs going off every day. Other than that, the United States is actually what people should be afraid of, in my opinion. Can you talk a little bit as well about your Antigua citizenship process and why you are choosing to get your second passport and residency in Antigua? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's no secret that, you know, black people often just feel unwanted here and unwelcome. Um, if I'm being totally in a moment of transparency, I do have a nephew. He is 13 years old. And when my grandmother was growing up, her parents had to explain to her Emmett Till. And when my mother was growing up, she, they had to explain, you know, Rodney King and now I'm, you know, got my nephew and now I'm trying to explain to him Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland and George Floyd and Tamir Rice. And, you know, I just decided that the only way for me to extend the life of my nephew, a black child who will turn into a man one day, the only way for me to extend his life is to exit the U.S. because I don't want him going to school and getting shot up in school. I don't want him to be walking home and having a bag of candy in his hand and being shot. I don't want him to go for a run and not make it back home. I don't want my son, my nephew, because he is black and is minding his own business to be killed. I don't want him being killed by police or killed by, you know, um, any race of a person that feels that he doesn't have the liberty to to walk down the street or to go for a jog or anything. 
So I decided that the only way for me to see him turn into a man is for us to leave the United States. And I'm willing to buy his citizenship out of the U.S. and give him the passport. So that way he has a chance to live fairly. That's amazing. And you've also been taking him around the world <laughs> with you. You two have been you two have been to like what seven countries now and he's only 13. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to do that? Why you feel it's been so important to do that and what you think the impact has been on him so far just at age 13? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, the universe is friendly and I'm blessed. I'm blessed that I'm in a position to be able to show him the world because when I was growing up, I just had book reports about what London might be like. I didn't think I would actually be able to see it. And, you know, you know, ill town, you know how that is. You know, it's people selling drugs on one corner and you got the, you know, the good angel on one shoulder and the bad, you know, the devil on the other. And you're just like, yo, I don't want to become a product of my environment. Luckily, I had two parents who worked really hard. It's six of us. Um, me and my sisters and brothers, all of us are college graduates. When I would come home from school, from college, we didn't have any lights. And I would feel guilty. Like, you know, they're putting me through college, and but we don't have electricity when I come home to visit. So there was a lot of pressure there. But my mom said, listen, y'all are going to do something different than us. And I wanted to give my nephew all of the experience that I never had. So it was important to me for him to see like, you know, I don't have a choice between like joining a gang or selling drugs. And, you know, like those are not even my options. My options are, are we going to Greece for the AGNC or are we going back to London? You know, because I love Leicester Square, you know, this is his options. And, you know, it kind of gives him a broader view. He's more grateful. And now he has so many different possibilities in his brain because he's like, okay, Tanti, it's my 14th birthday. Um, I know it's COVID, but I love London. I love going to the Tate Modern. Are they going to be open? So he's able to experience so much just because his auntie decided to just get out there and do it one time. So I want to make sure that he knows that there are so many, regardless of what color he is, he knows that he has a lot of options and that he, he can do what he wants and he's deserving of that. That's so awesome. I love that. The other thing that I want to talk to you about that you have done, which is super impressive, is talk about your entrepreneurial journey. Because you started, first of all, just doing the thing and you started doing all of this yourself. Then you developed your expertise in how to do it. Then you started realizing that you could teach other people how to do it and monetizing it, right? And you started it off as a side hustle. And then you eventually were able to leave your job and do this full time and be the location independent entrepreneur that you are today. So I would love to hear a little bit about that journey because I feel like there's a lot of people in that position where it's like, you know, they're passionate about certain things. They do certain things. They, you know, they love it. They're experts at it, you know, but they don't know how to parlay that and monetize that into something that can produce more income eventually than even their job does, right? And that allows them to get out of the corporate job and really do what they love as an entrepreneur and have ultimately then the location independence, right? That you now have and the total freedom of mobility. You can go to any country you want and stay there for however long you want and do your thing and move around. And you achieved that, right? You wanted to achieve that. You, you hustled for it and you got it. So for people that are in that corporate job right now and everybody has stuff that they love, everybody has stuff that they know how to do, everybody has stuff that they're good at and that other people ask them for help with, right? Can you talk about your entrepreneurial journey and how you were able to build your passion and your expertise into a business that allowed you to leave your job? Yeah. So it was super organic how it all happened. You know, I started solo traveling and girls on the gram was reaching out to me like, damn, I see you solo traveling. How are you doing that by yourself? And I'm like, well, actually I have a system, you know, on how to do it. So if you want to meet up, you know, whether it be over FaceTime once a week or in person at a coffee shop at Starbucks, we can meet up and I can show you how I actually solo travel and all the steps I take. And that just turned into to me actually solo traveling and a girl from Forbes reaching out 
And she was like, yo, um, I, I just so happened to type in this hashtag. I see you doing your thing. Let me interview you. You know, you've been to almost 50 countries by yourself. Let me talk to you. So me and the writer from Forbes met. She asked me how I was traveling the world and all of my trick systems and everything like that. And then next thing you know, I was in Forbes, like, you know, girl from East Orange made it to Forbes just by doing something that I loved. And once people started finding out more about who I was and how much information I had, you know, I've been solo traveling by myself for years and I just started getting a lot of attention and, you know, I stopped letting people pick my brain without monetizing the fact that I knew something. And I think as entrepreneurs, when we're first starting, we have this imposter syndrome, like, should I take money from them? Cause do I really know enough? You know, guys, at the end of the day, if you know that you're really good at something, there's always a freshman class, right? So consider yourself a senior or a junior. There's all, you always have a freshman class. There's always somebody who doesn't know as much as you, you know? And so, my definition of an expert is I have more than general knowledge on a specific subject, right? So, you know, me traveling to 55 countries as a female solo traveler, I have a little bit more than general knowledge on what people know about solo travel. So if you guys have something that you're really good at, you're really passionate about, and you're really knowledgeable about, don't have imposter syndrome and think, hey, I got to have Forbes articles and all this other stuff to actually show people how they can get where they need to go when you already have what it takes, you know, believe in yourself enough to say, hey, I know that I can help you and I'm going to charge for it. So can you talk a little bit about the course and the coaching program that you built and that you currently offer now? Sure. So my course is called Travel Like a Boss and that is Boss B-A-W-S-E because I'm a boss. Okay. (laughs) And so Travel Like a Boss is a six week online coaching program that teaches women how to travel the world safely, confidently and most importantly without draining your bank account so whenever I work with women and they're taking this online course it's completely self-paced but also in addition to the self-paced course online I also coach women one-on-one every week for six weeks and even as they take each of their solo travel trips I'm always there um, via telephone to make sure that they get the support that they need while they're on vacation as well and I also share all of my itineraries with you so that way when you want to go to Guatemala, you already know who the driver is. You already know who my photographer was. You already know which Airbnb I stayed or hotel. You already know where I went to get a COVID test to enter, to re-enter, you know, um, Antigua or the United States. So um, yeah, I absolutely love what I do. That's so dope. Can you talk a little bit about how you built and scaled the business from a side hustle where you just had people hitting you up on Instagram and it was kind of a casual thing where people were finding you and you were meeting with people at coffee shops and stuff like that and how you eventually were able to scale a side hustle that you were passionate about into a business where your income exceeded what you were making in the corporate world and you were able to just leave your job and do it full time. What was that transition like for you? So the transition was basically me fine tuning my product. I knew that I could teach women how to solo travel, you know, just the way I did as safe as I did. And also using the same methods, you know, that I did. And so basically I taught it to so many women that after a hundred or 200 women, the questions were all, all always pretty much the same. Right. And so I said, you know what? How about I just evergreen this because I fine tuned this and it has went through the wash with so many hundreds of women. I'm going to evergreen it. Once I evergreened it on ever webinar, I put it in on the Internet and now it runs every 15 minutes and women literally buy my course while I'm sleeping. And so for anybody out there who wants to, you know, scale their business, the only way that you're going to scale is to evergreen, because if you're trying to do, you know, 20 women with a cough at a coffee shop, you know, every week or 100 women at a coffee shop every week it's going to you're going to burn out. So. I decided to evergreen so that way I could talk to hundreds of thousands of women a day and them all get the same information, you know, without me having to experience that burnout. 
Right. I love that. And, you know, what I got from that, what you just described, if I'm distilling down some of the principles of it, the first one is that you really tested and interviewed your customer to understand again and again and again, customer after customer after customer, what are their questions? What are their concerns? What are their biggest fears or, or perceived obstacles, right? That they have, that they want to overcome, that they will pay you to tell them how they can overcome. And you just did this so many times that you knew exactly who your avatar was, exactly who your car customer was, exactly what their concerns were, and exactly how to resolve them. And then once you did that level of market research, which I think is really important, then you were able to create a universal evergreen product, uh, which is your gateway sort of free webinar, which is amazing, by the way. I watched the whole <laughs> thing and it is outstanding. I mean, it's like super high value content that's also hilarious and entertaining. So I'm, I'm going to encourage everybody to just check it out, uh, either because they're interested in you know your product or just if they want to see an outstanding uh, example of amazing marketing. I'm Gonna, we're going to link it up in the show notes so people can go check it out. But then all you have to do from there, once you have your funnel set up, right, and you have your free webinar that then at the end of it offers people to go into your paid content, then all you have to do is just marketing and you can just turn up the spigot on the number of people that you drive to your webinar. And you, as your lead flow goes up and you convert those people, your income goes up, right? Absolutely. Like once I was able to evergreen it at this point, travel like a boss has women in 12 different countries. And all of this started from my phone, dog. Like you would have thought I was trapping. Like I didn't have a computer. I didn't have shit. I just had an idea. I had a system that worked for me with at least 34 countries. And I was like, yo, you know how many women are out there that actually want to travel the world? They got the bread. They actually probably not even scared to do it. It's just that they don't know where to start. And they don't think that they can actually do this without other people around. And I was like, you know what? I got something for y'all. That's amazing. That's so awesome. I also want to ask you a question about personal brand building. You now have over 40,000 followers on Instagram. And I want to ask you about that and tips for people on personal brand building and how you were able to do that. Yeah. So listen, if you have a product and you know, you're testing it and you want to refine it until it's your, it's your perfect product. If you want to build a brand, definitely start to develop relationships um, with other people in the community of your niche. So for me, cash money is cool, but relationships are also a form of currency. So what I would do was my audience is women who want to travel. I would reach out to Instagram pages like Travel Noir, um, Jet Black Travel, Black Travel Feed. And I would say, hey, listen, I have this course. I've been featured in Forbes. You know, I, my shit is legit. You know, you can come check out my webinar for free, dog. And if you think your audience can benefit from having this information so that way they can start their travel journey with enough knowledge that makes them comfortable, they have safety tools, and they don't have to drain their bank account to do this, check out my webinar and let me know if you think that there's some value there and if you think your audience can benefit from having this information. And from there, if a, if a, if there was an Instagram page um, such as Travel Noir and they have 500,000 followers, they were now sending 500,000 followers to my Instagram so that way they can come check out the webinar. So I'd say make sure that you've put your product through the wash so that way you can defend it from the mountaintop and that it's refined because if you put it in front of, you know, 2 million people, then it's either going to be a big yes or a big no. Like this is either going to be great or an epic fail. Um, and then once you have that refined product, start rubbing shoulders with people who have the audience where your niche actually hangs out, you know, I, I, you know, coach women who want to travel. So of course I would go to girls love travel Facebook group. They have 500,000 followers. Of course I would, you know, contact the admin because I know that not only are these, you know, women, but these are also women who are interested in travel. And I got this free webinar. You got 500,000 women. 
of course they're going to be interested in this course, you know? So if you want to have some type of brand identity, the first thing that you have to do is make yourself relevant in this community of where your audience is. And you get that relevancy by just making sure that you're constantly in their face, you know, that you're, you're someone who adds value, you know, just being more relevant. Um, I have a saying, there's no such thing as competition. I don't have any competition at all. There's only people who might be a little bit more relevant than me, right? So, you know, that takes the pressure off. So I definitely say show up, develop those partnerships because that's a form of currency and just make sure that you, you know, do things to make yourself relevant. All right. Also, though, your Instagram pictures are bonkers. Like your Instagram feed is next level. And I want you to give. Yeah, for real. Uh, We're going to link it up in the show notes for sure. So everybody can go follow you on the gram. But I do want to ask you about that because a lot of people are saying, okay, if I really want to, you know, build my personal brand, let's say on Instagram or, uh, you know, an image centric platform. Right. What tips do you have for that? Because you got some pretty solid hacks, right? For like how you're getting like professional quality photos and epic spots, you know, in all these places that you go. Can you share a little of that behind the scenes? Of course. So people often say like, well, if you solo, how you getting all these pictures, sis? Come on. I told you that I'm I'm like the queen of finesse. All right. So. Whenever I go on a solo trip, I just go on Airbnb and instead of clicking stays, I just click the button that says experiences. So there's usually a photographer in every country. You can do a photo walk or a photo tour. Right. So let's say I meet the photographer in Paris and, you know, my photo tour is literally ninety eight dollars. I basically get two hours of photo with him. So I bring like six different outfits And I'll email the photographer before I get to Paris and be like, dog, this is a two hour session. I'm going to bring six outfits and I need to take pictures in all different parts of the city. Can how many places can we cover in these two hours? And it basically helps you get your content all out the way, you know, when you first start. And so basically that's how I get, you know, a photographer in every country. I just pay like in um, Colombia, it was thirty six dollars for a two hour photo shoot. And I brought like seven different outfits. So literally, you know, again, this is all about finesse. This is all about doing the most with the least. Okay. (laughs) I love that. All right. I want to ask you one more question before we wrap this up and move into the lightning round. When you, when you think back on all of the places that you've been and the people you've interacted with and the experiences that you've had over your many years of travel, how has all, of that travel impacted you at this point in your life? Why do you continue to travel? What do you get out of it? What does travel mean to you? I'll be honest with you. And like, you got me like in this particular place because I've never actually said this before for an Essence interview or a Forbes interview. So this is like a Maverick exclusive. If I'm being completely honest, I'm able to do a little bit of healing and a little bit of growing in every single place. And when I leave from every country, there's a part of me that's been reborn again. And there's a part of me that has also died. It's a lot when you're traveling to different countries, you are able to slow down time a lot. So you're able to think about some of the things that you did or some of the things that you didn't do, missed opportunities. And whenever I'm solo traveling, it's really a moment of clarity and reflection for me. And I'm able to make peace with a lot of things and also make new personal agreements with myself, create personal expectations with myself, be a lot more confident and then move on to the next country. And whatever I didn't like about myself, I left it, I left it in that country and whatever I liked about myself, I took it with me to the next country now. <laughs> what an amazing answer. You are amazing, Kim. <laughs> at, at this point, are you ready to move in to the lightning round? Hey, I was born ready. You know I'm from Carnegie and Shepherd. I was born ready. <laughs> Let's do it. The lightning round. All right. What is one book that has significantly impacted you over the years you'd most recommend people check out? Ask and It Is Given by Jerry and Esther Hicks. All right. If you could have dinner with any one person who's currently alive today that you've never met, just an evening of dinner and conversation with you and that person, who would you pick? Beyonce. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's a great fake. All right. Knowing everything that you know now, if you could go back in time and give one piece of advice to your 18-year-old self, what would you say to 18-year-old Keem? Jump. If you're on a ledge and you don't know what to do, just jump. You might actually learn to fly. That's awesome. All right. Of all of the places that you have been at this point, what are your top three favorite travel destinations you'd most recommend people check out? Um, So definitely Antigua because I'm actually living there, right? Dope place. I absolutely love it. Um, Another place that I definitely recommend is South Africa. There is a lot of history in South Africa. If people can just go to South Africa, I went to South Africa. I saw the bullet holes in Nelson Mandela's house, the tree that he planted. You know, it's so much history. You can actually learn to speak Costa, you know, um, meet with the Zulu tribe. And that was just a place where I just felt absolutely amazing about myself. And another place that I absolutely loved is Paris. That's where I gained my wings. You know, that's where I took my first solo travel trip and I never looked back. Paris made me believe in who I was and who I could be. So I'd say those three. That's awesome. Okay, Kim, what are your top three bucket list destinations? These are places you've never been the highest on your list you would most love to see. So I want to go to Tokyo. I have to get to Tokyo now. Like that's like some next level stuff. So I want to get to Tokyo. I want to get to Bora Bora, the French Polynesia. Like I, it's like a dream for me to go to Bora Bora. And another place that is just absolutely like somewhere that's on my mind, hardcore is New Zealand. Everybody tells me New Zealand is so clean. The people are so nice. You got to get to New Zealand. So I'm hoping to get to New Zealand. That's amazing. Yeah, you do already have the ticket for Tokyo, and you and I have talked about Tokyo pretty extensively, so yes. definitely hit me up when you're uh, ready to uh, finalize that itinerary. I'll give you some more, speed down. some more specifics. Yeah, but that, that city is lit. You are going <laughs> to have an amazing time. All right, Kim, we are now coming to the final and most important question of the entire interview. I'm about to ask you your top five hip-hop MCs of all time. But before I ask you that question, I want to just give you the opportunity and sort of ask you to share a little bit about what hip hop music means to you and what you love about hip hop. Hip hop music for me is all about life. You know, it's, it's the fact that you can immediately be uplifted just by listening to someone else and their story, their illustration. Hip hop has changed my life because it's kind of let me know like, hey, you can keep going and move forward. You know, hip hop is like water to me. That's so awesome. All right, Kim, last question. Who are your top five? All right. So definitely Biggie Smalls, for sure. Tupac, Jay-Z, Nas, and this one going to sound real random, but yo, Eminem is a crazy lyricist. He, he is so underrated. Like I think of, I think of, you know, Biggie Smalls. I think of Tupac. I think of Jay-Z, Nas, but Eminem, people be sleeping on that boy. So I, I definitely would say those are my top five. That's so awesome. That's amazing. All right. Kim, I want you to share how people can find you, how they can follow you on Instagram, how they can connect with you. And I also want you to take a minute and talk a little bit about your course and who is really your ideal customer of the people that might be listening to this podcast. What types of folks should potentially work with you and at least come and check out your introductory webinar and your course offering? So if you're a woman and you're like between the ages of 22 um, and maybe 40 and you're like, hey, you know what? Listen, I want to start my solo travel journey. You know, I want to learn how to do it safely. I want, you know, to have the confidence. You know, I want to build up the confidence to actually do it. I want to have the knowledge that makes me more confident in taking that step. You know, I want the support. Then definitely um, reach out to me. My Instagram is the passport abuser. And you can actually go on travel like a boss and boss is spelled B. 
B-A-W-S-E. And you can go on travellikeaboss.com, click the button for the free webinar, and just come get lit with me. Come get lit. Bring your wand, just like we brought it tonight. Bring the weed. Bring whatever you want. Just bring your pen and pad. Be ready to take notes and just learn. It, the webinar is completely free. So all you have to do is just show up with a pen and pad and be ready to learn. I got you. I love that. And if they come from the Maverick show and they use the code Maverick, is there any special treatment that they're going to get? Yeah. So guys, my course is actually four ninety seven. But for everybody who shows up from your boys audience and uses the code Maverick, I'm going to take this course from four ninety seven to just ninety seven dollars. Use the code Maverick. All right. We are going to link all of this up in the show notes. We're going to put Kim's social media handles. We're going to put the link to her free webinar. We're going to put the code and how you get your mega, that's about a 75% discount off of the course. We're going to have all that in one place. Just go to the maverickshow.com, go to the show notes for this episode. And definitely, please, I'll tell you, do yourself a favor and watch her free introductory webinar. It is amazing. I learned stuff from it that I never knew. I've been full-time traveling the world now for over eight years. I learned stuff that I didn't even know. And I literally was laughing probably every five minutes out loud. It is so entertaining and hilarious and substantive. So I encourage everybody to check it out. We're going to link it up in the show notes. Keem, this was amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's an honor. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you by cash flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber. To get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals, schedule your free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash audiobook. Whether you want the latest best-selling novels or books on a 